My name is Frank Agrama, and I am a co-worker with Elderberries and the youth section, and really grateful to see all of you here today. Um, our work has been in the in the spirit of Ida Wegman and and still is a great question for me of who is Ida Wegman. Um, but I'm glad to know that this missing piece in the um, in the present is just this question of the you know the feminine in the story of this last century. So it's a ripe time for for these stories to come and for us all to gather and celebrate. So I can be grateful that this is the largest Zoom call that we've uh, had the privilege to host, and it's it's a good thing to celebrate. So I would say to introduce Michaela, um, it's it's in great gratitude that we've been able to come into collaboration now since the summer. Um, bringing Alliant together, inspired by her work with Eliant, and the um, the question of this bridge, which she asked that this verse be brought, and this bridge that um, Goethe offered in the Green Snake and the Beautiful Lily, that one alone cannot do it, but those who come together at the right time. And so I just see um, this bridge and this fairy tale um, that Mikhail has been holding space for. So I, I think about Mikhail and I say, oh yeah, well, who's to say that's a male or that's a female? We have, we have Mikhail right here, you know, working. I'm sure many people have thought about that, um, but glad to have a tough warrior working in, working in the world and working in language and building bridges for our work here. So it's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to invite you. I'm uh, sorry, I kept muting you. I don't want you to be muted, but <laughs> yeah. So thank you for being here, Michaela, and for sharing uh, on the working with Ita Wegman and Rudolf Steiner. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Thank you, Dotti. Thank you, Milena, for this introduction. To approach Ita Wegman is always challenging on the one hand. And on the other hand, all what we know about her is that she was so human, so approachable, so spiritually present. I thought considering what might be interesting for you to share, I maybe share those points in, yeah, about which I can say that Ita Wegman influenced my own journey very much. Because we have from Salmans, Emanuel Salmans von Emichoden, three volumes about the biography of Ita Wegmann. So those who want really to deepen their understanding of her biography, I can highly recommend to read these books. And then Peter Selk published a lot from the archive and is still very busy to really go through old documents and thousands of letters we have from her all handwritten. So it's amazing to realize for how many people she was important and she influenced their lives. In the beginning, I would like to show you one photo which I got belonging to this friend circle of the Ita Wegmann Institute, Peter Selk is chairing. This is Ita Wegmann when she was studying medicine in Zurich as a student. As you know, she was one of the first 
who did the full medical professional training qualifying in gynecology and as a general practitioner. It was in her time not yet so common that women appeared at university and there were still many universities who had no female students. So she was, as you can see, what we say a pretty woman. She was tall, she was just right, balanced. Her posture was in beautiful proportions. And the first aspect I would like to share is her being as a world citizen. She was for me really a model how to be in modern times, to take color, language, territory, folk, just as a gift of destiny, also the gender. It's all a gift of destiny. It is something I carry as a good to make something out of it, but not to identify with. Ita Wegmann felt not as a woman. Ita Wegmann felt not as an Indonesian Dutch person. Ita Wegmann felt as a human being and was wearing all these attributes as belongings, as a sort of clothing she was wearing, social clothing, constitutional accessoires. But she was a human being and lifelong worked how to make the best out of what destiny gave her as tools, as possibilities for her biographical journey. And I find this is really modern human lifestyle. So I wish so much in our falling back humanity to national and racistic qualities, you know, that we move on towards humanity and not towards falling back where we are coming from and what was maybe a thousand years ago important. So maybe I can just leave this as a first impression and people who knew her in this Indonesian times, they share how courageous she was, how she loved to go to school and to learn and to be in contact with people. But then when she became a teenager, she went back to Holland to finish their school. And when she was on the ship back, it was about 18 years to Indonesia, her fiance, he was a young soldier, died from tuberculosis. And she was 18 years old and it was her relationship, the first and most important one in this regard she had. And to have him now on the other side of the threshold was an amazing experience for her. So the mission of this boyfriend was that he opened her mind for the realm beyond the threshold. And so she became quickly contact to the Theosophical Society in Indonesia and became member of the Theosophical Society as soon she had the full age, she was adult. 
And then she started her professional life first, as we all know, in as someone who trained different methods in massage, in body work. So her orientation was therapeutic to help others to feel good in their body and to make them fit for their lives. And so she came to Berlin and listened around the beginning of the 20th century, one of Rudolf Steiner's very famous lectures, what was already mentioned about Goethe's fairy tale of the green snake and the beautiful lily. And she realized when she heard this lecture, this is my teacher. That is the sort of esoteric I'm looking for. And that is very interesting because before that Goethe lecture, she heard already other lectures by Rudolf Steiner, but she wrote in her diary, I did not attend a lot of these Steiner lectures. It seemed to her rather philosophically. It was not what she was interested in primarily. But when she heard Rudolf Steiner speak about esoteric backgrounds of this fairy tale of Goethe, she realized he is, an, he is an initiate and this is really the teacher I was looking for in the Theosophical Society. Sorry, is it possible to stop the noises? Because I need my full concentration. This would be very nice if you could mute those who are not talking right now. Yeah, and so it was for Ita Wegmann a sort of new beginning in her life. And she had many conversations with Rudolf Steiner about esoteric matters. He invited her in the esoteric school in the framework of the Theosophical Society. And in many conversations, she also shared about her professional engagement. And she started one day as well a bit to complain, particularly about physicians, how ignorant they are, how little empathy they really have for the needs of the patient. And one day Rudolf Steiner said to her, you know, stop complaining. If you think doctors should move on and develop a different behavior, I think you should yourself study medicine and make it better instead of complaining what others are doing. This is not the way. But she had not the final university opening exam, the abitur, the matura from school. So she first, and that's what she also said, then I need first to go back to school, so to say. So in evening courses, she prepared for this final school, high school exam, which is a precondition in Europe to go to university. And then we have a very touching letter from her to Rudolf Steiner before she passed this exam. She asked Rudolf Steiner if he could not give her a meditation to calm down her fears of examination. She wanted so desperately really to make it 
and not to repeat it, she wanted to study medicine and she realized, ah, oh, but the chance to fail is still given. And unfortunately, we do not have the answer by Rudolf Steiner. This would have helped for sure a lot of students. But the honesty in which she describes her soul situation before this examine is so encouraging, so touching. And I often shared it to young people that this is not exceptional. If you have your first decisive examine to pass, it's a little initiation you have to go through. And therefore, I wanted to mention it. She was so honest. And that is something which Rudolf Steiner also liked very much in her being in their relationship. One could absolutely trust what she was telling. Yeah, and then there was a conversation with Marie Steiner, Rudolf Steiner and Ita Wegmann, and she asked, where shall I go? Because she wanted to study in Munich, where Rudolf Steiner quite often was, or in Berlin, where he was at home. And she was asking, where shall I go? Munich, Berlin. And then Marie Steiner said, you should go to Switzerland. Our movement will anyway come one day there. You know, and this was 1907. And Rudolf Steiner was still not yet working out the mystery dramas. He had not yet planned the Goetheanum as Johannes Bau in Munich. You know, all the following years where Ita Wegmann were studying, Munich was supposed to become the center for anthroposophic work. And the main building, the Goetheanum, the later Goetheanum, should be there. But Marie Steiner just said this. And so it happened. Because in 1912, in autumn, it became clear that the authorities in Munich did not give the permission for this building. Although Rudolf Steiner tried to follow all the obligations, the final decision was a clear no. And short time after that, he was invited to Switzerland for lectures and he came to Basel and he lived in the little outdoor house, countryside house from this, he was a dentist, a rich dentist, Basel citizen. And he shared to his host this problem with Munich and he was very interested and asked a lot. And when it then was clear, there is no possibility, then Mr. Grosshein said, but it's interesting, I recently bought a huge land in Donach and my wife did ask, but what do you want to do with this land? Of course, in Switzerland to buy land is an investment in, in many countries, it is like that, but there was no reason why to take this one? And then he answered to his wife and said, I do not yet know for what it is good, but it might come. And when Rudolf Steiner shared these problems of having not the permission for his building, for his mystery theater, he immediately said, in the presence of his wife, you can have the land, I bought it. I'm happy if you can use it. And so Rudolf Steiner visited together 
with the two, this land, and then he, it was said that he slept this night after this, looking the land, observing the land, he could almost not sleep. He foresaw probably many, many things that will happen at this point. And it is of course, Sorry, I muted you, Miguel. Sorry, hold on. Mute <laughs> me. It's now okay. Yeah. So when did uh, was the interruption? What was my last word? He slept. Sorry. Couldn't sleep. He couldn't sleep. Ah, he couldn't sleep. Yeah, because he foresaw probably all what will happen at this place, but he decided to take it. And then Mr. Großheitz bought in addition more land around this land and said, if you take it, then we need really to round up this whole territory and make it a real significant center here. And so when Ita Wegmann finished her studies, Rudolf Steiner and Marie Steiner were in Switzerland. And so she invited Rudolf Steiner in many cities. This was already before he moved over because he didn't allow her to travel to Germany during her studies to listen his lectures. He said, you need to study and not to follow and listen my lectures. And so she invited him in many little branches in Switzerland because then it was close and she could listen to a lot of lectures. But when she then finished, she moved to Basel and opened a big practice in which she worked and yeah, an, an outpatient institution and was looking for a building to start a hospital. And this is now a next picture. She as a doctor attending the first medical course in 1920 at Easter. Last year we celebrated 100 years anthroposophic medicine. And she attended this course and decided already during this course now I will buy a house and start an hospital so that we can prepare the anthroposophic remedies and immediately work with them with really ill people. But we have to observe them, we have to be bedside, we have to be close, it must be a hospital. And already one year later in June, she opened this hospital and invited Rudolf Steiner. He wrote a little prospect in, with a description for which this hospital should be. And you must imagine this hospital, she had 15 beds in this little house and nine physicians and a wonderful group of nurses. So each patient was surrounded by many doctors. Each patient was a sort of research, I will not say object, but a research goal. So to understand out of anthroposophic understanding, to make anthroposophic diagnosis and come out of understanding the imbalance of the four members and of the threefold organization to understand each concrete situation best possible. Of course, mainstream diagnostics was clear. Most of the patients were not healed, were not helped, but they were examined well by other mainstream doctors. And then she got from all over the world patients 
with severe problems who wanted this anthroposophic treatment. And Rudolf Steiner saw in the years 1921 until he fall ill in autumn 24. So in these a bit more than three years, he saw almost 600 patients with her. Every free time he had beside lectures and other obligations as the leader of the newly founded Anthroposophic Society, he spent in the hospital to help this new medicine to start and to root well. In this hospital, which then later had the name Ita Wigman Clinic, and today it is Clinic Arlesheim, which was the first name. It was just an hospital in Arlesheim. She had a subtitle Clinical Therapeutic Institute to make clear we are researching the concept of a new medicine. And when she still was in Zurich and had there her first practice before she moved to Basel, she heard already about mistletoe out of lectures and advices he gave. And just to show how courageous she was also as a medical doctor, she immediately picked some mistletoe from trees, prepared together with a pharmacist, the first preparation with the name ISCA, and first treated rabbits with this Iskador. She made animal trials to prove that no harm may come out of that application because oh, mistletoe is a powerful plant. And these rabbits felt so good with this mistletoe injections. And so she did not hesitate to start to treat cancer patients with significant success. So this courage to heal, this taking serious the results of spiritual research and just do and just observe the result and learn out of this observation how to improve. And when she had questions, she immediately came up with them to Rolf Steiner. So she was one of his most active students. And what he loved particularly was that she brought anthroposophy in practical life. As you know, to make anthroposophy practical, this was Rudolf Steiner's goal from the very beginning. But he had to wait until people were asking him. So this is a mystery. Already in 1907, he gave lectures on education out of spiritual knowledge. No one did ask how to do a school. He had to wait until Emil Molt, after the First World War, was asking him. And so it was for him the biggest joy of his life that in the last years, really the very last years of his life, world of education, biodynamic agriculture, anthroposophic medicine, Christian community, at least four very important cultural fields could be started as spiritualized everyday professional life so that he could say to educate rightly understood, to do medicine rightly understood, to do agriculture rightly understood, to do religious work rightly understood, it is all service for God. It is divine service or service for the divinity. It is Gottesdienst. 
And in his last lecture for medical doctors and priests together, he even says, no profession is subordinated to the other. The priest is not higher than the doctor. The doctor is not higher than a priest. These professions are all coordinated to one another because they all serve the spiritual world. And that was the impulse of Ita Wittmann, to serve the spiritual world, to live in the light of the spirit and to, to do all her work in service of humanization of humanity, to contribute to this tremendous task in materialistic times which becomes so dehumanized through the wars and through materialistic thinking and so on. And to plant this seed to humanize and to stop this illness of one-sided materialistic thinking. So this was she as a doctor and about her to the young doctors, for example, Rudolf Steiner said often, she has the will to heal. She is really willing to help. She has the courage to heal. And she has this sense for destiny. He even said karma wille the karma will. Because whatever we do, we influence destiny. But to do this out of this clear attitude, of course, when I act, I influence the destiny. But I do this out of my best intentions. And if I fail, I will take all the consequences. So this beautiful bridge meditation we heard three times in the beginning, that was really her destiny will to live always in presence, knowing we are all coming out of a past. We cannot know what all happened in that past. And we have to go towards future. How can we use this moment of bridge to help one another to humanize, to develop further? So that was the mood in which she worked and lived. And therefore, it is very significant that between this first medical course, Easter 1920, and her opening of her hospital, at St. John's time, before St. John's time, it was 6th of June, so in summertime, between these two was Christmas. And this Christmas 1920, he gave her this bridge meditation, something which she carried through Christmas time and brought then into the opening situation and all the preparations for this first hospital. It was a huge work to find the people to get it done and to finance and all that. And this process to become an anthroposophic hospital founder and famous anthroposophic doctor was then accompanied by this bridge lecture. But it is for all people helpful who want to learn more about spiritual presence, what this really means. For this, this meditation is an eye-opener. <laughs> 